Perfect. So welcome to a special edition of our Physique Educational Series as we brought along our partners today, GB Hockey, um, along with the medical team and Brendan Creed. Um, as always, we want you, the viewers, to gain an insight into the professional sporting world and specifically in this episode, what therapists or physios, healthcare practitioners um, can do to help support players through a long-term injury. So joining us today, we have a 74-time capped international for England and GB Hockey, uh, Brendan Creed. Uh, Matthew Davies, um, England and GB hockey physiotherapist and previously uh, professional rugby and football with um, some work in private practice as well. Um, and we might have Sophie Weaver, who's um, England GB physiotherapist, join us um, in a little while as well. So just a huge thank you for you uh, both for giving up your time. Um, I'm sure everybody viewing this is going to have a um, great fun listening to what you've got to say and some of the activities you've got up to during your rehab as well so the plan that we're going to go through today is um, kind of draw a bit of a roadmap of a road to recovery um, and pick up some of the key topics throughout the journey uh, such as motivation the olympics lockdown um, the support from men, uh, from medical team family friends um, and mental health and everything in between so brendan do you just want to explain the injury where you're at with your career prior to the injury and just paint a picture for the viewers um, to show what happened. Um, yeah, I can do. So it was October 2019. Um, we were out at the European Club Championships and with about, obviously with about nine, 10 months to go to the Olympics, um, I ruptured my ACL and tore part of my calf as well in the process. Um, so yeah, that's probably the easiest way to paint the picture. Yeah. And, and did it, was it, so AC and was that where, did you, you say, you did, did your knee dislocate as well during that? Yeah. So basically the, I mean, knee dislocated, but it popped straight back in and there was no, so there was no meniscus or any damage to any of the other ligaments in the knee. It was literally just anterior cruciate, which was pretty lucky in the end. But if, and was that, was that a fixture based in the UK or was that a broad in so that was in Barcelona, ironically, okay. five minutes before a player in my team had also uh, ruptured an ACL. So it was a heavy impact, heavy emotional day. Uh, yes. Yeah. Barcelona. And so, Matthew, were you present at the day at the game of that? No, he, he was away with club, actually, with a club service. Right. So, yeah, he came back to us a few days later with a pretty swollen knee. And a sad look on his face. And um, yeah, when, when we first looked at him, like just probably echoing what Brendan just said, we were, we were a, little, a little bit worried about um, the structures around the posterior lateral corner of his knee. Um, but luckily, when the, when the scan came back, yeah, we, he's just got a, a, a low grade calf injury and, like I say, the isolated um, ACL injury. But luckily, no, no chondral injury and no meniscus injury. So, a little bit of relief after we got the MRI back. Yeah. So you travel back from Barcelona, you obviously had the assessment with Matthew and the team um, at GB Hockey. And what were your initial thoughts, Brendan, of the injury? And um, were you told then the sort of time that it would take to come back and the sort of details around the injury? Or what was your sort of thoughts around that time? Uh, I actually left the room uh, to go and throw up. Uh, <laughs> I didn't really, I was, it was more shocked than anything else because uh, previous assumptions were that actually it wasn't as bad as what it was um but then obviously as you, you only ever know once you get the results um and from that point i kind of just wanted to know time frames so i just kept asking is there a chance and even if there was a slim chance i was fine and if there wasn't then i think my road to recovery would probably have been very different to what it was um so from that point of view yeah it was all pretty much this is the time frame there is and this is the time frame that we think we can fit in. And I think what the whole way through the rehab process, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but I basically said, if I'm not good to go, then I'm not good to go. It wasn't going to be a rushed rehab to play in the games and then career stop. It was more a case of, I've still got a few years left in the tank. So we didn't really want to risk it all for one games, as weird as that probably does sound. Um, very much a view long-term as well as short-term. Yeah, I mean, first question was, wasn't it? I'm, it was like, are we going to be able to get this back in, term, in time for the Olympics? Yeah. And um, it, it was, I mean, lockdown obviously scuppered that 
plans anyway. But it was it was it was always going to be tight, but it was always potentially doable. But yeah, it was it was you're right. It was it was coming down to a few. You had to be ready on a set date. I think maybe mid uh, mid June ish. I think you had to play in a, a couple of games in June to allow you to have enough game time before the holding camp for Tokyo. So it was going to be tight, but um, yeah, it was it was definitely decided early, wasn't it? If, if you weren't right, we weren't gonna we weren't gonna force it. I think it was a two week window we had between my return and selection. So I mean, realistically, it would have been incredibly tight and probably naive from my point of view psychologically that I was convincing myself that I was going to go. But at the same time, I don't think if I'd have got myself into that headspace, I wouldn't have gone about the rehab process the same. Um, so from that point of view, I think we had a window and I was determined to hit that window. And if I wasn't good enough or I wasn't ready, then so be it. But I was going to give myself a chance. And you mentioned there, so you said you went out of the room and threw up. Is that through shock of the Olympics and possibility that that isn't now going to be on, on the cards or the extent of the injury or, or kind of everything in between? Extent of the injury. Um I didn't, to be honest, I wasn't really thinking Olympics at that stage. It was more actually what had happened. I'm a bit of a freak injury player, so I don't really have too many muscle injuries as such. Um, but I get like broken bones and joints dislocated, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, I kind of, this was just another one on the line. It just took me a bit by surprise. Um, but after that initial day, I'd say I was pretty good in terms of how I went about the whole process. So, yeah, so you, you found out on that day and then what I think a lot of practitioners and stuff are quite wary of is, is there is that, I suppose, morning period where athletes have to digest that information, um, especially, so was that sort of a week long, a day long? How, how long did it take you to kind of go from your mindset of the shock and everything to the sort of positive, motivated attitude to, to get back? Um. I gave myself about 45 minutes of crying, I'd mm -hmm. say, in probably the physio room, um, which whoever was luckily enough to stumble in would have witnessed. Um, and then post that, it was kind of all go, 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 really. We had scans, we had um, meetings with the surgeon. Um, so from that point of view, there wasn't, it wasn't so much slow as there was quite a lot going on, which was quite good because it just kept me busy. Um, and then I was still basically... I had to keep my quad and calf or quad and hamstring as, as strong as possible prior to the surgery itself. So there was still quite a lot of work to be done on that side of things, which was actually, again, really good. It was kind of just making sure I'm doing the right things to make sure that when the surgery happens, we're in the best place possible to attack the rehab post. Cause obviously there's going to be quite a lot of muscle loss and obviously where the graft's been taken, the hamstring is going to get significantly weaker. So we're trying to get as strong as possible prior to make sure we're good to go from the point of rehab starting. And it, so Matthew, just on that, um, the surgery, just so uh, viewers and stuff can kind of get an understanding of the timeline. So just talk us through the first sort of six weeks briefly. So from injury to obviously traveling back and scans and surgery, what does that kind of look like from, from your side with the player? Yeah. So once we first saw him, um, Post, post came back from the trip. So he obviously had a really swollen knee. Um, we, we basically put him on crutches um, just to offload it. Um, we obviously, like Brendan mentioned, we got a, lined up with a consultant for an orthopedic opinion. So, you know, we preferred, you know, he was obviously going to go for surgery. So we're just trying to get that in as soon as we can. I think, I can't remember how exactly how long that took, but it would have definitely a few days. So in that time, we were kind of using uh, cryotherapy. So things like game ready, um, compression and just trying to get the knee to settle down as much as we can um, and as, as Brendan, Brendan mentioned um, just trying to minimize um, muscle loss as much as we could as well so you know using like the um, the complex um, so using that passively just to try and keep some kind of muscle stimulation going um, and then went for surgery and then post-surgery so we kind of we usually give it about a six week period after surgery so um, that just gives a knee the, the goal with that initial period post-surgery is just to allow the knee to settle down as much as we can so we want a really quiet knee by the end of that so in an ideal world be no swelling 
um, and, and good range of movement as well. So the main things you're looking for is trying to, well, the main, main thing is getting knee extension. Um, so making sure that's really important, obviously, when you're weight bearing through walking and then looking to get back to running. Um, and then decent flexion as well. So we always try to mi absolute minimum about 90 degrees by the end of that six weeks. But luckily with Brendan, he, he worked really hard um, and had pretty much full range by the end of that six weeks, I would say. Um, There's quite a lot of swearing in the physio room as we're kind of pushing into that, but um, he worked well with it, yeah. And then, so obviously that time after surgery, um, how important is it for you guys as a medical team to... Um, understand the player what they're going through and do you try and understand the personality of the players and do you approach it slightly differently in that quite sensitive time with different players yeah definitely I think you know it's I think a big part of being a physio anyway is being able to show empathy uh, and, and demonstrate that and you know you've got an athlete here who's you know nine months out from the Olympics and is being told he's going to have to have an ACL surgery I think you need to you need to be able to be sensitive around that. Um, but yeah, for sure, different athletes will respond differently. I know I know for sure some people will just be like, yeah, that's fine, the crack on, where others would would probably deal with it slightly. We'll take, like you talked about that morning, morning period may take a little bit longer. Um, we're really looking at EIS because we've got really good support. So we've got a sports psychologist as well, and we've got um, performance lifestyle as well, who are absolutely brilliant. And I don't know, maybe Brendan... I think probably found um, definitely had some conversations with them um, just to help kind of getting through those early stages and coping strategies and that sort of stuff. So we're really lucky because it takes a, takes a little bit of a work workload off us from, from that point of view, but it probably comes back to um, working as an MDT. And, you know, if we know the athletes particularly struggling, we've got those avenues we can kind of get the players um, connected to. Yeah, definitely. And so, um, one thing that we, we talk about with a lot of people in professional sport is the ability to work with other departments within the club. Oh. So the SNC team, um, as you mentioned there, performance um, lifestyle, is it performance lifestyle coach? Is that correct? Oh. Yep. Yeah. Um, and but other uh, people and communicating like that. So uh, in that period, is there anything that you think for people working in professional sport or aspiring to professional sport, what they can do, to work better within teams, uh, within into departments, if that makes sense. Um, is there anything that you guys do that that works really well for the players and for yourself? Um, and is that through communication or, or how's that all work? Yeah, it's. Pro I, I mean, it's, it's probably doing the basics really well. I think so. I think what we're really good at at our department is we have like regular um, rehab meetings. Um, so we usually have a meeting beginning part of the week and another catch up at the end of the week. So for someone like Brendan, so getting that, uh, usually at the rehab meeting is usually S and C physio. And then we've got access to nutrition, like we say sports psych as well, if we need as well. So, you know, getting goals in, I think is really important. So even though we can't do a lot, um, we know we have got some certain goals to work on over that week. Um, so make sure everyone's on board with that and, you know, make sure Brendan's on board with that as well. So we know what we're all aiming for. Um, and I think also identifying issues early uh, or potential hit trip ups along the path early um, and getting practitioners in, involved as quick as you can. So, for example, um, nutrition is probably a good example because they're not necessarily won't be full time. Um, so it's quite easy to kind of slip through the net. So it's probably just making sure, you know, you're aware who you've got access to um, and just yeah awareness about how they can influence on this player outside of your own scope, scope of practice yeah perfect and so we've so six weeks um let's say we're at six week mark we're looking at full range of motion or trying to get as good range of motion as possible after surgery um then then what's the process after that what did you guys do with brendan yeah so that six week mark like i said he worked really hard um we got full range of movement. Um, the knee hadn't quite settled completely. Um, so we, we had a bit of residual swelling on there. Um, so we, we decided to, you know, we, we basically these had fairly significant muscle wastage uh, around quads and hamstrings compared to his other side and calf as well. So we just basically started targeting those, those muscle groups. So looking at close, close chain uh, strengthening exercise in the gym. Um, using the Compex a lot as well, um, started adding in some like 
uh, body weight movement patterns. So looking at like squat and split squat, um, all in a really controlled manner. Um, so what we don't want to do is basically challenge your knee in any rotational patterns in that time, because he's not going to have the muscular control around the knee. Um, but we're just really looking at, yeah, starting to um, look at hypertrophy of the quadriceps, hamstrings and calf muscles. So getting him in a place where really after probably the next six week period is in, is in a place to look to start, um, start back to impact work and running. Um, so around about 12 weeks, we'd probably look to do that. As long as he's reached the physical kind of um, uh, capabilities that we'd require for that. Um, so I guess just touching on that, you know, we're looking at, um, we're really looking again at EIS because we can, um, got good diagnostics abilities. So we've got access to like the four stacks. So we can look at um, soleus strength and gastronemia strength. And we, we kind of got enough data in our squad um, to be able to see what's, what, well, Brendan's previous PBs, also a squad average. So um, we, we know, for example, if he's got a weak calf, that's going to really uh, have big influences on ACL stability. So if he's got a weak calf, we put him back running too early, we are putting him at a little bit of risk. So we're really building up all those kind of strength, strength gains. So when we do assess him at that 12 week period ready to running, we know he's in a really safe place to be able to start that. And, and from, from your perspective, Brendan, so you've had that first six weeks. Now you're back in the gym how what was that like for you to be able to start doing something different were you at that point where like you say you're getting frustrated or were you like just enthusiastic to be able to do the gym work and, and sort of get back to it um I guess I was quite excited just because it was doing something that just doing something again mm. so there's quite a lot of lying around and basically movements whilst I was just lying on bed in fact I think most of the first six weeks was Matt doing work more than I was um <laughs> on that front just to try and mope the knee as much as we could. And then the next six weeks was just a bit of fun, really just trying to work out what I can and can't do and where we're at. So it was more a case of, as Matt said, getting diagnostics, using the ISOK -OK machine a lot. Um, that was good fun, I'd say. Um, yeah. So from, from my point of view, it was actually just getting stuff done and kind of just trying to work out how my body's feeling, how I've, uh, the other parts of my body are feeling as well. Cause obviously there's going to be a bit of time where it's probably going to overcompensate. What does that feel like and everything else? So kind of just me knowing my body as much as possible. Cause the last thing I want to get to is a place where I think I'm, well, the staff basically think I'm ready and I know my body's not, but I'm going to push through it. I didn't want to get to that stage. I wanted to get to the stage where everything was pretty open and honest between myself and staff members. So I think from, as Matt said, like having a sports psych, having a lifestyle manager, having a physio and an SNC coach that would pretty much, available whenever I need them was great um and at the same time I'm not that person I'll only use them if I if I really want to use them as such so I was quite happy whereas obviously with Matt and Roy who was on my RSNC is basically I spent a lot of time with those two in close proximity and a lot of times with them so they probably saw me day in day out go in a lot of fluctuations in my moods and things like that so it's for me it was great that they were really consistent as a pair so I didn't know if Matt and Roy, I didn't know if they were having a good day or a bad day. They were the same person throughout the whole process, which helps me as an athlete a lot. And me specifically as well, who's quite an emotional person at times. Um, so as Matt says, there's probably a lot of swearing, linked or not linked, who knows. But um, yeah, from, I guess from that point of view, I was it, the next six weeks were actually just quite a lot of fun, just kind of testing everything out. Yeah, that's a good point, I suppose. And you either I suppose feed off the energy and that comes back to the relationship that you have with the physio obviously um yourself and Matt um seem to get on very well so it's quite easy to have those open and honest conversations but like you say throughout the whole process um how important it is to have that good relationship um did you during this time you obviously had the injury did you use um did you use this opportunity to look at other injuries you had I know previously you mentioned you had some other injuries did you think of working on other areas of maybe game technically as well? Was it an opportunity to do that or was it solely focused on the knee, everything, nothing else matters? Um, so about five months earlier, I'd ruptured an ATFL on the other ankle. Um, so the balance work initially was quite entertaining because on one side I had a horrendously dodgy knee and then on the other side I had a pretty poor ankle stability. So all BOSU work and all um, proprioception work was basically working both sides, which was pretty beneficial because on the ankle side of things, we 
although the rehab was thorough, there was still a lot of work that probably needed doing on that side of things. Um, so from there, it was basically that side. I was basically attacking both sides on the legs and then upper body. I basically not managed to do a lot due to previous injuries as well. So for me, I was, it was a real opportunity to put some weight on and over the course of the six, seven months that I was in intensive rehab on that side of things in the gym, I think I'd put on three or four kilos. So there was a real opportunity that we did take, um, which again is thanks to the programming done by Matt and Roy Soph and stretch like on that side of things, which is actually really beneficial. Yeah, because that, that helped with your um, injecting as well, didn't it? Was it like injecting and aerials as part of the game, as part of your game was a bit of a target towards end stage, wasn't it? Once you could, we really kind of allowed you to work on that in the gym. Um, yeah, from a performance perspective. Yeah. yeah and then, so after that six, um, six weeks or so, gym work, um, you touched upon it earlier, then it's moving to running. Um, yeah. So finally probably go outside and <laughs> do something else. Um, so yeah, just Matt, do you want to give an overview just from that, that next sort of six weeks and we can take some sort of touch points yeah. from there? So, so I, guess, I guess it's always a little bit nervous um, as a physio when you're trying to, when you really put, start to push people on and you're changing a new, to a new stimulus. Um, so the, the main thing obviously is trying to reduce the risk of any anything going wrong with that. Um, so, you know, when, when we're looking at that, we, we like Brendan's there, we use the ISOK machine quite a lot. Um, so that just gives us some good strength diagnostics around quads and hamstrings. So it gives a little bit of reassurance that, you know, he can produce force through there. Um, and then we also, like I said, we use the force text quite a lot as well. So looking at cough strength and looking at max isometric strength as well. So um, like a 30 degree push through the quads. Um, so again, it just gives us a, a, a force, um, force diagnostics, basically. Like, okay, he can produce this much force and we know we're roughly going to get this from running. So we can say, okay, he's actually strong enough to be able to run, which is really important. Um, so once we kind of got that baseline data, we can then, we start to plan, yeah, basically returning him back to running really. So it usually always starts with some um, well, plyometric work, so like double leg jumping and that sort of stuff. Um, and then that feeds in then again to looking at the jump data we get from the force decks as well. So we always do like a counter movement jump and a drop jump. Um, and again, we can relate that to the forces going with running as well. So we know if we can do a drop jump, or again, we're pretty happy that he's going to be able to tolerate the ground reaction force we're running. Um, so once we're happy with all that, um, we look at doing things like running drills, so like A skips and B skips. And then that just inevitably then feeds into just linear running. So we always start linear first. Um, minimum stress, minimum stress is possible the ACL. Um, really limit the amount of turning he does on it. So we're going to avoiding any kind of quick stimulus where he's got to twist and turn on it for that initial period. Um, and pro probably, probably a two or three week period of that of just building up the volume of that. I would say, um, and then also in that time, the gym also really pushes on as well. So you know we continue to push strength in the gym, and also we're getting a new stimulus from the running. So we're looking for any reaction. Um, the main things we're looking at with that are really maintaining the quiet knee. So we don't want any swelling on there at all. Um, and make sure, yeah, he's not getting any kind of loss of range movement or anything along those lines afterwards, which is ne never, a, never a smooth process. It's never a linear process. I think always when you push things along, there's always like four steps forward, two steps back. Um, one of the challenges we had with, with, with Brendan right, right from the beginning was trying to get the knee completely completely settled from a swelling point of view yeah. um yeah. and that that took a long long time and you know we, once we returned back to running it it never really got any worse but it kind of didn't resolve completely um so we're always a little bit conscious of that because obviously you've got swelling on the knee you're always potentially going to um, have influence on knee stability um so that was a big target for us before we wanted to push on to change the direction tasks and it's quite an interesting point you mentioned there in terms of, you know, it's not always just a sort of straight curve for, um, from yeah. one stage to the next. And, and Brendan, you, you mentioned earlier in terms of like knowing your own body. So there's a sort of three factors in play here. There's, I think, the knowing your own body from the athlete. You've got the data that's suggesting um, where you're at. And then you've got uh, the physios installed in confidence and trust into actually you can go and pushing them forward to do, to do new exercises and stuff. So, Brendan, was there any times that you thought your body was in a better place? There may be the data showing or vice versa or um, 
and how did you kind of deal with that with the physios so we um so we actually had it drained at one stage during the process didn't we we had it so we had to get rid of the swelling i didn't really think it was much but obviously these guys know the clinical side of it a lot more than i do so i was like yeah let's crack on um there were two times that i thought i'd ripped my hamstring during the whole process um it was one running and one bouldering where I was a bit nervous, but all that happened was the hamstring tissue was just pulling away from the scar tissue from where the graft had been taken in my hamstring. Um, so from that point of view, that was a case of I was in full panic and Matt was one of the calmest blokes in the world. And he'd be like, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. We'll be fine. I came in and naturally everything was fine. The scores, I think we had like one or two days where it was a little bit quiet afterwards in terms of the amount of workload we did. And then once it settled again, we just cracked on. Um, and any time that I didn't feel it felt great, we had the discussions as a athlete and uh, physio and SNC as well. We kind of, there was a lot of time where there was the three of us, not just two of us, which was great because you can, so if you're feeling great, we can push it a little bit and, if not, actually, well, let's not worry about that because if we actually look after it now in the long run, so the day after, maybe the two days after, actually, it might feel better that you can then push and you don't really lose any of what you think you're gaining. You kind of, you might just gain it on a different day. Um, so I think there was a, there was obviously daily discussion when we were in, um, in Bisham and kind of having those conversations face to face. And equally, when we went into lockdown, there was still that conversation over WhatsApp and, a lot of video calls between the three of us kind of just making sure we're keeping on top of everything on that side of things. So it was a lot of open discussion where if I wasn't feeling great, I'd be very comfortable saying it. Um, no matter what form it came out in, there was definitely a conversation of how I'm feeling basically every day. And say likewise from those guys, like if they weren't happy with something, they would tell me quite openly, like if it didn't look right or it looked a bit uncomfortable or a bit awkward, they would tell me. So there was a lot of, Initially, there was a lot of conversation about extending my knee in walking phase and in jogging and everything else. There was, it, from a lot of point from their point of view, there was a, there wasn't enough um, straightening of the knee. It was constantly staying in a flex mode, so there was there was a lot of chat about that side of things, which was frustrating as an athlete. But at the same time, I'm not going to argue with them because they know exactly what they're talking about. So I've just got to try and do it. It was just difficult to do. Um, and definitely, and I suppose for for you guys it always come back to your objectives are both the same, isn't it? To try and get you back returning to play as quickly and safely as possible. Um, I think the friction, like you say, comes from the panic, you say the emotion side of it and the external factors of Olympics or pressure from athletes or coaches or whatever that can kind of um, sort of become a, a friction to it all. Um, I'm quite interested. You mentioned bo uh, bouldering, um, which obviously is nothing to do with hockey i can imagine <laughs> do you just want to explain how that came about and how that was included into the rehab i wouldn't exactly say it was included into but, the rehab yeah. <laughs> um i guess my it was a great mental relief for myself as an athlete doing something every day or four days a week where you kind of everything's intense everything's stressful everything's critiqued and you kind of it's a really intense atmosphere to then go and do for example bouldering um, was great fun because the atmosphere at a bouldering hall is completely different. It's someone will see that you're struggling with a problem and they'll actually offer some help and guidance and kind of on that side of things. But what we didn't realize initially was how stressful it is upon the body, um, which was actually great because then we started using it as a training stimulus, not just as a mental relief. Um, so myself and one or two other members of the squad kind of just went down to the local bouldering wall and basically cracked on from there. And then, I've, I had a conversation with Matt just one day in Bisham and basically said, oh, I went bouldering. And that's how we basically understood. So there was a bit of more understanding of kind of, there was quite a lot of bouldering tasks eventually start upper body stuff started being put in the program, um, which was a lot of fun as well, because it's just something different that wouldn't normally be put into a textbook program, but there's a, there's a different stimulus so not just a training stimulus, but it's also a mindset stimulus. So you, you're keeping things interesting, keeping things fresh that as an athlete makes a huge difference during the rehab process, rather than doing the same um, exercises each day, there was a definite, a, a real effort put in by 
Matt and Roy to really change up. So we're hitting the same principles. We're hitting the same muscles. We're hitting the same groups, same movements, but in a different form. And that's a, that's a really big thing for myself as an athlete. And I'm sure for them, it was probably quite interesting just trying to work out how they could hit different muscles and different groups with different exercises. Yes. Yeah, so, so Matt, when uh, Brendan came to you and said you'd been doing, he's been doing some bouldering, what, <laughs> what was your initial reaction? And it sounds like you embraced it. Um, and yeah, what were your initial reactions and, and why did you then embrace it and um, go along with it? Yeah. So, I mean, by that stage, we were, we were kind of fair, quite a long way along the rehab path where we we're fairly happy from a knee strength and stability point of view that it wasn't going to be a a massive risk but my first impression was what the hell are you doing <laughs> to be completely <laughs> honest um, just had, had visions of him falling off a boulder halfway up and landing on his knee on a soft mat and I was like oh god this is this is like disaster waiting to happen um, but once we kind of like all right what are you actually doing there you know the roots were really easy um, it was all really controlled we kind of put some rules in place that he wasn't going to do anything ridiculous where he was going to really push himself and fall on his knee or anything like that. So I was happy from that point of view. And then um, we were kind of, as, as I kind of went along over the next few weeks, it, it turned out actually to be a really nice, um, different stimulus in terms of challenging the knee. So, you know, you're getting some really funky positions. So it's getting rotation through the knee. Um, using the hamstring a lot. So it really exposed actually how weak the hamstring was in different positions. Um, so that was quite nice as well. Um, so yeah, I, th I think in, in hindsight, it was, it was, um, it's actually turned out to be a really good thing. Um, I don't think it's particularly um, recommended necessarily, but I think we did it in a, in a safe enough way that we were fairly happy about it because we put enough rules in place. But yeah, um, it was an interesting uh, addition to the rehab we were doing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we didn't, it wasn't like, I, so I didn't start during the rehab process. I'd started previously to, so previously before I got the injury. So it wasn't like I was just, oh, I'll just go and try it. It was a question to Matt during the process was of when do you think I'll be able to go back and do it? So we didn't, it wasn't just randomly willy nilly attack it. It was, yeah, let's make sure this is actually quite safe. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, so, I mean, it, it sounds great to, to embrace change and to, to do these things and the positive impacts it has on, on the athlete. Um, and embracing change brings us to the, to the next part, which is um, when you, I think you were close to the sort of end of the rehab programme. Um, don't know if you know that there was a coronavirus and a, a national lockdown. So, um that's a change I don't think anybody really saw coming. Um, so wh when that lockdown hit, I think from the sort of schedule I've got here, you were sort of close to um, close to the end of the sort of rehab cycle, looking to come back to return to play. How did the whole pandemic um, affect your, uh, your schedule? So the games were still on at that stage. So it was, we were still attacking everything. So I was doing a lot of road running, a lot of change of direction work. Um, luckily had a pretty um, exceptional gym space that I could still use um, located in the house that I was staying in during lockdown. So I was pretty lucky on that side of things that I still had access to a bar, weights, uh, dumbbells. Uh, we had a K box as well. Um, and I had a lot of boxes as well for box jumps and things like that. So I was pretty lucky on that side of things that I still had a lot of uh, equipment there. Um, and so whilst basically when lockdown happened, I went from obviously going into Bisham to doing a lot of training on my own, but then a lot of sort of calls. So the sessions that I was doing in terms of change of direction were normally over video calls with uh, Matt and Roy and Sophie as well, um, just to basically check in, just to make sure I wasn't doing anything irrational or anything stupid in terms of movement. It was all making sure it's controlled in the right uh, way of doing everything. So from that point of view, I think we dealt with it really well. Um, I guess the issue was when the games got cancelled, I lost a lot of motivation as an athlete myself. And I think that was probably when it was harder for Matt and Roy to actually try and get me to do stuff and kind of that side of things. I lost, I just simply just lost interest, um, which is nat natural when you lose a goal or a goal's not really achievable. Um, so there was about a three week period where I think I was pretty much uncontactable 
just because I just didn't really want anything to do with rehab because I think I was a combination of tired and fed up, um, which is obviously a very bizarre way to look at a COVID outbreak and everything else. But that strictly from a selfish athlete point of view, that's what happened in my motivation. Yeah. And I I think you touched upon the the sort of goal setting and definitely the motivation. Um, So would that coincide around the time of um, Olympics was postponed? Was that around the same sort of time? So what you thought of Olympics coming, it's everything's quite uncertain. And like you say, it's a bit fed up. And what, what are we sort of aiming for? We don't even know when our next game is and it stuck in doors and no one knew what was going on. So, so Matthew, was that, do you think from the sort of medical team, did they, um, how did you guys adapt through that and try to keep the players motivated or um, and adapt with the old processes? Because I could imagine you used to people coming in every day. Um, yeah. So how, how did you sort of adapt yeah, to that? To- totally new environment and a, a new challenge for sure. Um, so we, were, we, we basically, when we knew we were going to go into lockdown, we, we kind of like, okay, what does Brendan need at home? Um, like I say, he's actually quite lucky because he had a pretty decent gym set up anyway. Um, but we thought one of, one of the good, one of the main things he needs to keep on with is kind of eccentric strength and kind of how are we going to target that in a home environment. So like I say, we got, we got him a K-box, um, which allowed us to keep, keep kind of um, targeting those, um, those gym goals really. Um, and then, like I say, that really coincided with us returning him to change of direction, sort of pitch, t- pitch tasks. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, it's, again, I t- t- mentioned earlier about it, it's always quite stressful giving the player a new stimulus, but then to doing that and doing it remotely was was fairly <laughs> fairly stressful. So we lots of video calls of him and his garden jumping around. Um and then, yeah, we basically setting up video calls, him on a, him on a, I think it was like the local cricket pitch. Um, so we send him a program, he'd set up the cones and then he'd go off and do it. And I remember, I think it was one of the first or second ones he did. We, he basically put the camera in his car boot looking out on the cricket pitch. And he's like, is this good? He's like, yeah, it's good, it's good. And then, and then he ran off and I'm not joking, it was about this big in the distance. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's completely pointless. And he came back after the first set. So I was going, yeah, yeah, it's good, mate. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> but completely pointless from my point of view. Um, so it, it was, yeah, it was, it, it was a little bit, a little bit hard work to try, try and keep on top of it. But I, I think we did pretty well. Um, like I said, just being really structured with what it sent him. And we knew we, we, what we sent him, if he covers this content, we know it's going to lead to this. Um, so we had a kind of end goal in sight, but like like Brendan said, once the Olympics got cancelled, um, he, he he yeah, like I say, said himself, he kind of kind of probably checked out a little bit for probably three or four weeks. Um, so he kind of yeah, we were doing little bits, but not really pushing on through that period. I would say. Um, so it was it was it was it was. I think everyone was in a similar boat, to be honest. Um, I think it's probably one of the reflections I would have on that is like. You know, could could we have done more to support him in that time from a from a medical point of view? Um, I, 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 yeah, I mean, we kept in touch, but it's kind of like, okay, you know, you, obviously you you've checked out a little bit here, but um, do we need to do more to help you through that? Or I, I, I get the sense that he was fairly happy to kind of check out and just leave things for the time being, and then to be fair, you you did contact us after after the two or three weeks and said, okay, I'm kind of ready now to get back going into it. Um, so I think you maybe needed that little bit of downtime yourself as well. Yeah, I, th- I massively respected that personally as an athlete. I think there's there's times to be hands on and there's also times to give a bit of space. And I think given what had gone on after over the course of the last six, seven months and, and this, I think it was the right decision for me as well as an athlete. Because I think if I'm not internally driven I, as an athlete, I think you're going to be fighting a losing battle. So I think knowledge of the athlete and everything else, I think it was the right combination to kind of go, do you know what? He needs a bit of space, whether or not he meant it. I think he did. Um, so from that point of view, I massively respected it, which is why, as Matt said, I checked out, but then I also checked back in. Yeah, you did. Because we got to the stage that it was like, do you know what? We need to ramp stuff up again if I'm going to be good to go come August, September. So from that point of view, I think it was really good from them and kind of there's a hands-on, hands-off approach. And I think it was the right decision to go hands-off and when I was ready to come back in, that's when we went at it again, which was, I think, really good because it just gave me a bit of time to recharge and reset and go again. And I can imagine from 
the medical perspective of that as well is is once you've said I'm I'm back in it, it's it's a lot easier because you've um, I suppose incited that motivation to start again. It hasn't come from we you have to do this. It's I want to do this. Um, what what do you think actually changed then? So you had two three weeks where you checked out. What was the thing that kind of made you go? I want to get back in and, and get cracking again. Um, I think a combination of just recharging. I, I don't think I realized how much the five months had taken out of me emotionally. I think I, because I was so driven by a goal that I, I didn't really take any effect. I think if I'd have gone through all the way through past the Olympics, I think it would have been a longer checkout afterwards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think I knew that there was a, come September, I knew I wanted to be back playing. I didn't really want to waste any time. So I didn't want to miss any basically start of the season. I wanted to get uh, a full season under my belt before the next game so I think on that side of things I we targeted almost like a timeline of we're going to need this amount of time to get back in and I'm still bear in mind I still haven't played hockey at this stage there was a real thought between myself and Matt and Roy that we need to get stuff under the belt first before we attack the game so we were pretty so I think I just wanted I guess I as you say I kind of just wanted to get back into it um at the end of the day, it's something I love. It's just something I haven't played for a while. So there was a bit of apprehension around that as well. So, but at the same time, there was also that real care and consideration from Matt Roy and Soph and Stretch just to make sure that I was ready to go when I needed to be. And so we had a different, instead of being obviously the games being, or the four matches before selection being the goal, now it was a case of first league game of the season was the goal, right? That, let's work out what we've got. So there was a lot of conversation between myself and my club coach as well, who was fantastic in accommodating that. Um, and there was a lot of relaying messages and making sure nothing was misconstrued, which again, there wasn't again, which is great because there was clarity from both camps, which was pretty ideal. So from an athlete point of view, there was no stress on me. It was just a case of conversations needed to be had and they were had. Brilliant. And so you touched there on the, the goal setting on, you set a new goal and one of the goals was now with the postponement not achievable. How important is it for you as an athlete to have, to have goals and are the, do you throughout this whole process, were they quite short term? Was it week by week? Was it month by month? Um, or was it like the end goal of, you know, Olympics? Um, we set a lot of, a lot of strength goals were set um, throughout the whole process and they were conquered daily, weekly, monthly, like they were constantly being reset. And it wasn't a case of Roy or, or the SNC guys choosing when the goals were, what the goals were. It was a case of me setting them as well. So it was a lot of ownership on myself as well as staff, which was great because then it's kind of, it's a joint venture and it makes it uh, one and more enjoyable, but two also means it's mine, if that makes sense. So there's a bit more ownership on me to really, I've said it, so I'm, I'm not going to let myself down here um, from that point of view. And with, uh, the physio side of things, the goals again were clinically set goals. So they weren't there to be messed around with. And if they weren't achieved, all right, well, we'll go back and we'll attack it and we'll, we will achieve it. It just might take a little bit longer. And that was understood by all camps, myself, SNC and physio. So again, it was really, it was quite easy to kind of follow the program, to be honest with you, because it was quite simple and we kept it as concise and simple as possible. I don't know, that's from an athlete point of view. I don't know if Matt has any other opinions on it no yeah I, I, I say yeah there's short medium long-term goals we used um yeah a lot a lot of strength goals so you know in, in order to push on to the next stage of rehab we, we generally use like criteria based uh, markers so that's got to be you got you know whatever that looks like in terms of a strength goal or whatever um so you know I, I think you know it's important to have those short-term goals but you know it's bigger picture as well we were working towards the olympics and we knew that if we didn't play in this game on this date we weren't going to make selection um but it's putting all the all the pieces in place to be able to get you in that in that place initially so um yeah just a mix, mixture of medium short and long-term goals really important i would say perfect and so now we've um, uh, got past the rehab program, looking at return to play. Um, I think one of your quotes that you've um, done, Brendan, was, uh, I'll, I'll read it for, for you guys, it was 330 days later, 327 days of moaning and 150 days of being stuck 
exercising indoors and finally let loose. Um, it'd be interesting to know what you're like on those three days you weren't moaning. <laughs> what, what, tell tell the, the viewers and stuff, when was that first moment of being able to play and what did that feel like? Um, I guess it's just pure excitement. Um, there's obviously a bit of nerves around trusting your knee and kind of um, there's that psychological barrier of, is it going to happen again? Um, but thankfully I didn't really have that uh, along with the work from the IS of the sports psychologists and the physio and SNC guys, they basically just filled me with confidence the whole way through the process. Um, we hit the numbers, which they knew would clinically mean I'd be absolutely fine. And kind of once that whistle goes and once you're back playing, that's it, you're, you're immersed. Um, and I guess that's the beauty of it from a athlete point of view is I never really had to worry about my knee in games. Um, I've not had the worry hamstrings, not really been an issue at all. Uh, apart from the two times where I thought it might've happened during the rehab process, but it was absolutely fine. I've not really had anything that's made me nervous about it. Um, so I guess I've been really lucky in comparison to other people who have had more issues. Um, so yeah, I guess it's just pure excitement. You're just doing something that you love again without having to worry about anything. Yeah, there's a few scars, but you get scars from anything. So from that point of view, I was kind of just excited and ready and kind of, we just made sure that it was safe. And that was the most important bit for, from my point of view and from the SNC guys point of view as well and physio point of view as well. And Matt, so when Brendan took the pitch again um, after the injury, what do you guys do as a medical team to help him get into the best place possible? I know Brendan mentioned a few about the sort of clinical side of things, yeah. but is there anything that you guys specifically do to, to really help uh, the athlete along for their first game back? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, main, the main thing I would say is having a good, good rehab content building up to that. So by the time he's actually gone back to that first game, He's done enough in training and he's done enough exp he's had enough exposure on the pitch to feel really confident. Um, so we use like subjective questionnaires for that sometimes, um, just to give an idea of his his confidence around the knee. Um, I remember when we did the first one, actually, it was surprisingly good. And I was like, okay, okay, we've done, a, we've done an okay job here. Um, I, I think that's a really big mark. You know, if the player is, if the player is generally confident on it, I, I, you know, take a, lot of, take a lot of trust in that. Um, especially if we've got all the, the strength data and all that other stuff we are normally used to back that up. Um, yeah, so I think it's that, 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 like I say, the main, main thing is I think is having enough exposure to all the things we know it's going to be a risk. So, you know, with, Brent, with, with Brendan's in, injury and his surgery, you know, he had a, he had a hamstring graft. So um, we look at what we did, what we did do, we looked at your GPS data. So we know, okay, so a normal training session will cover X amount of high speed running and it'll cover this much volume of low speed running. It'll have roughly this many acceleration decelerations. So we can work backwards from that in those previous weeks and really expose him to that. Um, so we know when he's going back into that first session, okay, it's going to be roughly 30 minutes. It's going to roughly look like this, but already over the past three weeks, you've done like triple that. Um, so that I think again just gives him gives him and more importantly gives uh, gives me <laughs> confidence that he's not going to re-rupture when he goes back on the pitch and then it's kind of building back up to the same, similar sort of process then when we're looking to build back up to that first game as well so we've got loads of international GPS data on Brendan specifically um, and we know like it's quite an interesting one because I think his amount of high speed running in a game is something like 20 meters. So <laughs> I don't know if that's Brendan's position or his playing style, but <laughs> we, we, know, we, know, we know from, uh, you know, with, with hockey, you know, we, we do the, the live subs, rolling subs. So when we're in a game now and then it'll have a full on 50 or 60 meter sprint. So that's, that's a, for us, you know, we can identify that and say, okay, that's a risk on his hamstring. We know he's coming back from that. Um, so we need to make sure he's got enough exposure for that going back. So that's just quite a nice example just we use to minimise that risk as much as we can. And, and then on that, so you've, got, you've been through the journey with Brendan for the whole time as well. So on an emotional level, is it, what do you guys feel is in, are you, are you nervous? Are you excited, just overjoyed he's back? Or, or do you try to remove emotion completely and just sort of... Um, stay quite focused on 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 the role really and, and you mean when he's returning back to yeah play? yeah um i i uh it's probably 
I wouldn't say nervous just because of all the stuff we've put in place beforehand. So we're pretty confident that he's in a good place. Um, I'd say it's, you know, it's a bit of relief, I'd say. It's good we've got him back on the pitch. Um, yeah, and I, I guess also a little bit proud of kind of the, the process we've gone through. And um, yeah, just re really satisfying from my point of view to get to get Brendan back and and see him play. And especially when you get feedback from the coaches and the other players saying, you know, he looks pretty good. He's not been back that long. You're like, OK, uh, that's really satisfying. So, yeah, that's probably my, my point of view on it. And, and probably happy that Brendan's not in your physio room every single day as well. <laughs> uh, you know what? He, he's, uh, he's, a good, he's a good person to have around in the physio room. So, um, but yeah, happy, happy not, not even in rehab, but um, yeah. Yeah. Um, perfect. So I think we'll leave that journey there in terms of um, the road to recovery for, for you, Brendan. I've got a couple of just quick fire questions that... Um, uh i'll fire to both of you if that's okay yeah um so brendan for, from yourself if what advice would you give to anybody who's um got a long-term injury whether that's work in a professional sporting environment or an amateur athlete what would you say is the one big bit of advice for them to get through that um i'd probably just say it's a real opportunity to know your body if you don't already um and just make sure that whilst you're going through the rehab or re recovery side of things, just really listen to your body as well. So if it feels good, you can probably push it. And if it doesn't, don't worry about it. Cause it, but it won't be a day lost. It would just be a case of, it might just take a little bit. It might take a little bit longer, but that's not a day lost. That's a day to rebuild. Um, so for me, I guess that's probably the big thing is kind of listen to your body and really do get in tune with it. Cause it's only going to benefit you in the long run, especially if you want to, to be playing sports later down the line with your own kids or grandkids. It's only going to benefit you. Definitely. And um, Matthew, from the medical perspective, what advice would you give to sort of therapists um, for people who are treating long-term injuries? Um, I think the main thing is probably don't, don't try to speed up nature. You know, I think with a lot of injuries, we try to, to get things back quicker than sometimes the healing process allows. So I think that's probably the main thing, certainly with, ACLs, um, I think that's really important for that initial period just to allow the need to settle down. And then also just, you know, looking at giving yourself as much data as you can to, to give yourself confidence to reduce any element of risk when they do go back. It's probably the main, main thing I would say. Perfect. And um, what was the most important factor um, to you, Brendan, from the support of family, friends uh, and the medical team? Um, I guess consistency, um, from a selfish point of view, it makes a huge difference as for an athlete, if the people around you kind of aren't uh, are there and they're not there and not there, they're just there. Um, so Matt and Roy being the same people that they are day in, day out makes a huge difference for myself because it means you, you, or you, na you naturally just create a relationship with people from that point of view so I wouldn't say I knew Matt that well prior to the process but I'd say after the amount of quizzes that I probably tried to put up in that room um just having general conversations learning that Matt for example goes to Glastonbury quite a lot like information like that kind of thing is although it sounds quite trivial is quite important because you're just starting to build relationships same with Roy uh, our S&C guys although he's not the loudest person in the world what he does give you is consistency so you can work off that um, same with families and th friends and things like that. It's just always ha just being consistent people, just being yourselves, not worrying about how you're acting around another person. Like I wouldn't say Matt changed across the process, whether I was ready to be uh, when I came in from the, from the initial surgery, for example, or prior to the surgery to where I was playing again, there was no inconsistency. There was no, Oh, I'm a treading on eggshells. It was just him. And that, for me as an athlete just means I can work around really well and create relationships from that point of view. Yeah, brilliant. I think, yeah, you definitely touched upon that. Um, the inter sort of personal skills and the relationship, like you say, with the Glastonbury stuff, there's, there's, it's just micro conversations that you have, which I can imagine through lockdown and stuff is, is harder to, to get because you tend to have a Zoom call and discuss the topic on hand rather than you know, you're in the physio room just having a little chat. And a, um, so, yeah, it's, it's a really good point. And um, so another one for, for you, Matthew. Um, 
what advice would you give a young professional sports therapist or physiotherapist who wants to work in professional sport? Uh, what advice would you give them to help fulfill their dreams? Um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's obviously like it's always a quite a difficult environment to get into. Um, I mean, I, I, when I first kind of decided I really wanted to work in sport, I ended up doing loads of volunteer, volunteering work. So um, with a local basketball club, um, I did a bit, a bit with like England touch rugby. Um, so just trying to build up your CV as much as you can with as much sport, sport exposure as possible. And then, yeah, it's, it is then just basically trying to apply for jobs um, and probably don't give up. That's probably the main thing. I, I, yeah, I've applied for so many jobs in sport that, you know, I've not even got an interview for. Um, but it is just perseverance, I would say, and just building up your CV as much as you can to, to help support your applications. Perfect. And um, yeah, final question, Brendan, what advice would you give to a young athlete to, who wants to become a professional hockey player? Oof, Jesus. Um, <laughs> I, I guess just enjoy the journey. Don't focus on the outset on um, the outcome of it all, just kind of enjoy what you're doing day in, day out and take the little wins um, rather than focusing on just the big picture all the time. Sometimes the small picture is also really nice to enjoy. Yeah, that's nice to put it like that. Um, perfect. Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, leave it there. It'll stay recorded. But um, yeah, brilliant. There's nothing else. Is that all, all okay for you guys? Nothing? Nothing controversial. That's the important no. <laughs> You haven't thrown anyone under the bus or anything. <laughs> no, it's all good. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, what we'll do, we'll um, record it, just edit out some of the um, end pieces like this conversation now. Um, we'll ping it to you guys just if you want to watch it, obviously it'd be about an hour, so just flick through it, whatever, um, and just let us know if there's anything that you don't like or, or want to take out, and we can do that for you. And then we'll let you know when, when we distribute it out as well and how we'll do that. We haven't got the concrete plan of that yet, but we'll, we'll let you know when that when that gets made. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks for your time, guys. Really appreciate that. And that was um, yeah, really good discussion. Loved it. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Cheers.